Okay, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, bienvenue à cette édition de la conférence commé commémorative annuelle Thomas Feeney, organisée par la section de Common Law de la Faculté de droit et le Centre de droit public de l'Université d'Ottawa. Uh, welcome to this year's Thomas Feeney Annual Memorial Lecture, organized by the Common Law Section and the U Ottawa Public Law Centre. Uh, my name is Vanessa McDonnell. I, uh, along with my colleague Terry Skolnick, am co-director of the Public Law Centre. Uh, and I'm thrilled to welcome you here today for the Feeney Lecture, which is being delivered by Professor, Professor Noura Karazavan. I'd also like to bring greetings on behalf of Dean Kristen Boone, uh, the Dean of the Common Law Section, who was unable to be with us this evening. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Ottawa is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people. We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region, from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders past, present, and future. Thomas Feeney, au nom duquel uh, un fonds a été créé et en mémoire duquel la présente conférence annuelle est offerte, était le doyen fondateur de la section de Common Law. His name is indelibly attached to the study of Common Law at the University of Ottawa. Dean Feeney strove to build a law school whose graduates would have a solid foundation for the practice of law and would be of service to the public and to the profession in Ontario and elsewhere in Canada. So I'm thrilled that we're able to welcome Professor Karazavan here today to uh, the University of Ottawa to deliver the Feeney Lecture. Uh, professor Karazavan is a full professor of public law at the Université Montréal. Uh, at the Faculty of Law. She is a leading expert on Canadian cooperative federalism, constitutional structure, and charter application. And as I said to my dean, <laughs> when we were sitting around talking about who the Feeney lecturer might be uh, this year, uh, there are very few who parallel Nura in terms of her rigor and her innovation as a legal scholar. Um, and so I think we're very lucky to have her giving the lecture today. After the lecture, we will move on to a panel discussion with a number of colleagues, uh, most of whom are colleagues from within the building, but also within the city. And again, I count myself very lucky to uh, be in a faculty of law and in a city where you can put together a panel of internationally recognized experts on the notwithstanding clause um, without leaving the building or the city. And so it's a real pleasure to uh, call these colleagues uh, friends and, uh, and collaborators. And so I'm thrilled to uh, introduce you today to uh, Professor Adam Dodick, who is a full professor at the Common Law Section of the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law. He also served as Dean of the Common Law Section from 2018 until June 2021. <coughs> Pardon. Benoit Pelletier, qui est professeur éminent à l'Université d'Ottawa, à la section de droit civil de la Faculté de droit. Il a été ministre du gouvernement du Québec pendant près de six ans, notamment ministre des Affaires intergouvernementales canadiennes. Next, we have Professor Carissa Mamathan, full professor at the Common Law Section, of the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law and a very recent recipient of the Mundell Medal for Excellence in Legal Scholarship. Uh, we also have Professor Phil Lagasse, who is coming to us from Carleton University, où il est professeur agrégé et titulaire de la chaire de recherche William et Jeannie Barton en affaires internationales um, at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University. So at this point, I would like to invite Professor Karazavan uh, to come up. The floor is yours. Right. Welcome. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much for this uh, very generous presentation, Vanessa. Thank you for the invitation. I thank the um, Public Law Center and Dean Boone for this uh, very kind invitation, as well as you, of course, Vanessa. Thanks also to my esteemed colleague who, um, colleagues who agreed to share this, uh, this panel with uh, myself. C'est un honneur pour moi que de présenter ces quelques remarques aujourd'hui à l'occasion de la conférence commémorative euh, euh, annuelle de Thomas Feeney. Euh, de ce que j'ai pu lire, M. Feeney, c'était un homme exceptionnel euh, envers qui j'ai beaucoup, beaucoup d'admiration, un bâtisseur, effectivement, <rire> un professeur aimé, exigeant, qui faisait des examens difficiles apparemment, un collègue, un universitaire euh, très respecté. Bref, quelqu'un dont il faut s'inspirer à tous les niveaux, sauf un peut-être, c'est celui qui où il avait six enfants, donc je pense que <rire> j'entends mon mari rire nerveusement en arrière. Donc, on va y aller, on commence. Alors, ça fait partie de réflexions qui euh, animent, qui vont nourrir un article qui est en construction, donc si vous avez euh, des commentaires, n'hésitez pas. Et euh, je, vais, euh, je vais parler en français, mais surtout en anglais, donc on va essayer de ne pas trop passer de l'un à l'autre, mais... De temps en temps, ça, ça va venir plus naturellement. So, before I start, actually, to start, I'd like to um, introduce you to two quotes uh, from two very recent cases at the Supreme Court of Canada. And the first one is by uh, dissenting judges Brown and Cote. And they, uh, in obiter dicta, a dictum, they talked about Section 33. So we have a very recent idea about what the courts uh, believe se Section 33 should do. And in their opinion, it is to allow a legislature to consider the impact of a court's decision, and so on and so forth. And a year later, Brown and Wagner, uh, and Cote as well, writing for the majority, they uh, again talked about Section 33 by talking about the fact that it reserves, it preserves, sorry, a limited right of legislative override where the court invalidates legislation, then uh, the, the legislature has the right to override this conclusion. So, I just want to keep that you keep these quotes <laughs> in mind. Uh, at this point, I'd, I will return to them later. So, today, what I will do is try to do four things, and I will check the time and write what time it is right now, because the time starts now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I have four things I want to do. Talk about the fourth case. Um, because it's the precedent, so when we talk about reopening Section 33, we're talking about potentially overturning uh, Ford. What are the reasons to do so? Um, so what should we put in Section 33 if uh, we are re reinterpreting it? And in the end, if I have time, what we should be reading in to Section 33. So I'll talk uh, briefly about the Ford case. So if you remember, there was a political, strong political reaction in Quebec following patriation without the consent of Quebec. So as a political gesture, the legislature adopted in June 1982 an omnibus bill that uh, shielded all Quebec laws from all permissible sections of the Canadian Charter pursuant to Section 33. And uh, one year later, uh, another derogation, but specific to the Charter of the French Language. So what we had is um, a derogation adopted in 1982, and bear in mind the Ford case is in 1988. So by the time we reached 1988, that derogation had expired, because they're only valid for five years. The other one, the specific to the Charter of the French Language, this one, for one provision particularly, was still going on at the time of the Ford ruling, because it was adopted in 1983. It was still on, but not for a very long time. And so Valerie Ford and four uh, other merchants, they alleged that uh, the language law provisions, uh, basically there are two provisions, one is uh, 59 and the other in 68, uh, were uh, invalid. And so the court had to uh, examine uh, these derogations. Were they still valid? Were they correctly made by the legislature? So it's important to know that this is not a, um, a situation where the provincial legislature reacted to a judgment. It was preemptive use of the derogation power. So there are three um, elements, if you want, of the, uh, of the Ford decision that I, I think are relevant here. And I will talk about the first two, and I will not address the retroactivity of the overriding provision. So the first aspect of the Ford decision, which is really important, is 
do we allow standard overrides? What's a standard override? It's, an, it's a general override. It's when the legislature derogates to all possible provisions of the Charter, which are Section 2 and 7, 215. The second question was, um, can we do that through an omnibus bill? Could we do like Quebec did, um, repeal all legislation and reenact it immediately with a, an additional provision in each uh, enactment of the legislature? That's an omnibus bill in which we insert a standard override uh, clause. And again, there's this question of the retroactivity of the overriding provision, which the court found that it could not be retroactive. So the court was not working uh, on a you know, blank page. It had an appeal court decision to work with, which was Alliance des Professeurs de Montréal. It's not Ford. It's another case that discussed the, the uh, validity of derogation uh, clauses. And this was the case that the court examined at the Supreme Court in Ca of Canada in Ford. And we had the judgment of Jacques, Justice of Appeal, and three other judges. So it was a panel of five, but one judge, Justice Kret, did not participate in the judgment. And so in that judgment, the Court of Appeal invalidated the standard derogation clause. Why? Because it said that um, when you derogate en masse, like generally, you don't respect the spirit nor the, the wording of the charter. And why uh, the wording is not respected, you see here in red, this, it's, um, I've, I've identified what just, Justice Jacques focused on, and these words that Section 33 provides that you could derogate or that your legislation shall operate notwithstanding a provision or but for the provision of this charter, so according to Justice Jacques, this meant you cannot derogate to all rights. You could if you have in your legislation potentially you, that you offend all charter rights. But then you have to demonstrate a link between your provisions and the right. But usually you have to identify one or several provisions to which your legislation uh, derogates. And so he rejected this idea of a standard derogation clause. He added as well that not only do you have to identify the right provision by its number, but you also have to write the words down, the name of the right that you're derogating to. The second, uh, la deuxième uh, chose que la Cour d'appel a décidé, c'est de rejeter le véhicule de la loi Omnibus. Pour la Cour d'appel, on ne peut pas effectuer une dérogation valide à travers une loi Omnibus parce qu'il faut, pour respecter la primauté du droit, que la société soit au courant de la violation qui est peut-être en train de se perpétrer. Et donc, il faut que la société, comme le législateur, soit bien au fait de ce qui, sont, de ce qui est en train de se passer, en raison de ce principe de la primauté du droit qui, donne, euh, qui, qui met en place un droit au libre débat du citoyen. Donc, selon le juge Jacques, c'est seulement si l'information nécessaire a été clairement fournie qu'on peut déroger au droit. Et il va donc refuser le véhicule de la loi Omnibus. C'est sûr que lorsqu'on décide que la clause dérogatoire type ne fonctionne pas, c'est assez évident qu'on ne peut pas employer le véhicule de la loi Omnibus, parce qu'une loi Omnibus devrait nécessairement, pour prévenir tous les aspects ou toutes les possibilités, utiliser une clause dérogatoire type. Donc, c'était presque obligatoire, compte tenu de la décision sur la clause générale, que la Cour d'appel invalide aussi la question de la loi Omnibus. Parce que dans une loi Omnibus, par définition, si on insère une clause dérogatoire, il faut qu'elle soit générale pas y aller avec juste un article. On arrive à la Cour suprême du Canada. Elle va renverser la plupart des aspects euh, de la décision Alliance. So the first thing that the court will do is it will decide that section 33 requires the legislature to respect only formal requirements. Et en français, elle va dire une certaine expression formelle de cette décision. Ça, c'est le point de départ. 
le corollaire de ça, c'est que Section 33 prohibits a substantive examination, une, su une justification prima facie suffisante of the override power by courts. Then the court goes on and sa say that, to say that Section 33 cannot require legislators to, uh, to establish a link between the overriding law and the overridden rights. And how does that link uh, is established? It's very simple. You just have to be specific about the legislative provisions which may be problematic. But the court says we can't ask that from the legislature. We cannot ask the legislator to be specific about the legislative provisions which may be problematic. As this, and that's the reason, this would open the way to substantive examination. In addition, the standard override is permissible because the legislature, poor him, sometimes he doesn't know exactly which rights are being overridden. That's why he needs to be able to use the standard derogation clause. And then the overriding provision may be inserted in an omnibus bill. There is no reason why it shouldn't. Section 33 doesn't prohibit it. And again, this sort kind of flows from considering the standard override permissible. So if you think the standard override is permissible, then you could see it being inserted in an omnibus bill. By implication, I think the Supreme Court ruling in Ford also stands for the proposition that a legislature may act preventively before any judicial decision. So if we return to the quotes in the beginning, I think Section 33 is already being reopened because we have obiter dicta that tend to you know, associate the derogation power with reacting to a judicial decision. But Ford doesn't stand for this because Ford, again, was in a context where the province had preemptively derogated from all possible rights. So, stare decisis. So let's start talking about that. Should we overturn a Supreme Court of Canada precedent such as the Ford case, which is the leading case on section 33? So we have two rules of stare decisis. We have horizontal stare decisis, which means that the court follows its own precedents unless there are compelling reasons not to do so, and we'll get to these. There's also the rule of vertical stare decisis, where lower courts are bound by upper courts' precedents, but they may overturn them in exceptional circumstances like we saw in the Carter case. So I checked the Bill 21 litigation facta at the Court of Appeal. I think there are uh, 12 or 13 of them. And I saw only two that raised the Ford uh, question, and only one uh, in these factor actually pleads for the, um, the uh, overturning of Ford. And if you recall in the decision in McGregor very recently, the Supreme Court had something interesting to say about uh, when we could um, ask for the overturning of a precedent, and that concerned the Hape case. And the court in that McGregor case about Section 32 said, if the parties do not ask for opening the case, reopening a case, and overturning a precedent, it is not the job of interveners to do that. So at the level of the Court of Appeal, we're still in the vertical stare decisis. But when the case of Bill 21 goes to the Supreme Court, if the parties want to have Section um, the Ford case reopened, they will have the parties themselves and not the interveners, um, they will have to make these arguments. So what are the compelling reasons? There's a, I, to, in order to get to my list, you'll see it's a, it's a homemade list. It's, I compiled uh, several decisions of the Supreme Court as well as uh, doctrinal uh, articles. And I put these together and I got to that list. So none of these criteria is, is sufficient, and they are not cumulative, and so you know how it is. We have criteria, but we can <laughs> wiggle around a little bit. So f the first point is academic criticism. So I, I read a lot recently, and I haven't seen a massive academic outcry about Ford. I saw a lot of writing how to go around Ford. 
how to invalidate legislation notwithstanding the Ford case. This I've read a lot, but people asking straight to overturn Ford, I haven't seen so many papers. And Quebec scholarship is mostly in favor of the Ford uh, ruling. But in any event, in McGregor as well, the court said, okay, on va relaxer avec la critique du monde académique. It's relevant, but it's not determinative. But another, another reason for overturning could be, not necessarily the Ford case, but in general, when the prior decision turns out to be unworkable and the application of that decision is, is complex and technical. I think in the Ford framework, we're totally at the opposite of that. We have a very simple framework. Everything is permissible as long as you say it ex you know, uh, ex uh, explicitly. It is, I believe, very workable. So, the other reason impérieuse pour renverser un précédent dans la règle du tarif des saisies horizontales c'est lorsque de nouveaux motifs qui n'ont pas été examinés avant le prononcé de la décision antérieure sont invoqués. So what is different? Qu'est-ce qui est différent ici entre euh, la situation dans Ford et la situation où on se retrouve aujourd'hui? Pourquoi moi j'ai été invité à faire une conférence sur la clause dérogatoire? Parce qu'on en parle beaucoup. Parce que récemment, euh, on le voit, elle a été utilisée davantage et on se sent exposé. On se sent vulnérable, on se dit hey, « notre constitution, est-ce qu'elle fonctionne si bien que ça? » Alors, il y a quelques exemples récemment euh, d'utilisation de, de, euh, plus, euh, plus déterminée de la clause dérogatoire. Et j'ai vu dans les arguments qui ont été soulevés qu'on associe le changement de circonstances à ce vent de populisme qui pourrait souffler sur le Canada. Alors, je vais regarder avec vous certaines dérogations récentes. En premier, on a la loi de 2021, que vous connaissez mieux que moi, euh, adoptée ici en Ontario, une loi visant à protéger les élections et à défendre la démocratie. Donc, cette loi, elle renversait la décision de Working Families et elle protège les restrictions imposées sur la publicité politique par des tiers. Donc, dans la loi, on déroge à la fois à la Charte canadienne, oups, il y a une erreur, c'est 2 et 7 à 15, pas à 25, et au Human Rights Code. Donc, ici, on a une double dérogation. Un des arguments qui était soulevé à l'égard de cette nouvelle circonstance, ce, ce changement de circonstance, c'est qu'à l'époque de Ford, on n'avait pas de double dérogation. La loi, la Charte de la langue française, elle dérogeait seulement à la Charte canadienne, puis on l'a vu, pas de façon nécessairement efficace avec le, le, cinq, le délai de cinq ans. Mais il n'y avait pas l'objectif de déroger aussi à la Charte des droits et libertés de la personne du Québec. Ce qui est différent, on va dire, c'est que maintenant, les législatures, elles dérogent aux deux. C'est la même chose dans la loi de 2022 visant à garder les élèves en classe, maintenant abrogée. Et euh, celle-là, elle déroge aux articles 2, 7 et 15. Donc, ce n'est pas la dérogatoire standard. C'est vraiment, on a fait l'effort d'aller chercher les articles euh, auxquels on déroge euh, spécifiquement. Au Québec, on a plusieurs exemples, mais disons seulement les deux plus récents. On a la loi sur la laïcité de l'État, euh, qui va déroger à la fois à tous les articles de la Charte québécoise et tous les articles de la Charte canadienne auxquels on peut déroger, évidemment. Et la loi 96, la loi sur la langue officielle et commune du Québec, le français, elle va déroger euh, également aux deux chartes. Donc, dans cette loi, peut-être que vous êtes au courant, euh, on va quand même assez loin. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'on va faire? C'est qu'on va retirer les services gouvernementaux pour les personnes immigrantes, euh, donc les services dans une langue autre que le français, six mois après leur arrivée. On va ajouter que la connaissance insuffisante du français est un acte dérogatoire à la profession, dans certaines professions, sauf certaines exceptions. Euh, on va imposer un quota pour les étudiants qui fréquentent les cégeps francophones. On va obliger aussi les étudiants autochtones à passer certains tests de français. Et finalement, on va exiger euh, deux autres choses qui, elles, ne sont pas assujetties à la clause dérogatoire. Donc, ce sera l'obligation de traduire les pièces et procédures là, devant les tribunaux euh, et euh, l'imposition, euh, donc les, les limites à l'imposition du bilinguisme chez les juges. 
Donc, on va assujettir ça à l'avis du ministre. Donc, les deux dernières choses que j'ai mentionnées, il y en a une qui semble aller à l'encontre de l'article 133 de la Constitution et l'autre du principe de l'indépendance judiciaire. On ne peut pas déroger à l'indépendance judiciaire, on ne peut pas déroger à l'article 133. Pour les autres, la, la dérogation pourrait fonctionner. Donc, on voit que récemment, il y a cet usage euh, au Québec et en Ontario, euh, mais disons, au Québec, c'est peut-être encore plus impressionnant de la clause dérogatoire. En Saskatchewan aussi, en 2018, euh, là, on a un exemple d'une dérogation vraiment spécifique aux articles 2 et 15. Et dans le euh, Saskatchewan Human Rights Code, c'est particulièrement, c'est les trois articles 4, 12 et 13. Donc, ça, c'était une loi qui permet le financement d'étudiants non catholiques dans les écoles catholiques. Alors, tout ça considéré, est-ce qu'on peut dire que c'est une raison impérieuse de renverser Ford? Le fait que les législatures se sont activées récemment puis ont décidé de l'utiliser davantage. Alors, moi, je ne crois pas. Euh, je pense que les circonstances à l'époque de Ford étaient beaucoup plus, euh, disons, les, la dérogation était beaucoup plus invasive parce que dans Ford, on a procédé par une loi omnibus où on a fait déroger l'entièreté des lois dans le corpus législatif de la province à tous les droits de la charte. Alors, on a vraiment réduit l'impact de la charte à zéro dans la province. Maintenant, c'est vrai que la double dérogation, c'est nouveau. Et là, on, on pourra en reparler plus tard. Mais c'est vrai aussi que dans notre système, pour que la dérogation soit efficace, parfois, il faut qu'elle soit à deux niveaux. So, the other reasons for overturning, because so far we haven't been very successful in our reasons, is the ability of the legislature to correct an error swiftly. So let's be realistic. The legislatures in Canada have no real ability to uh, change the interpretation of Ford through constitutional amendment, because to do that you'd have to rewrite Section 33, and to do that you would need the consent of seven provinces forming 50% of the population. And we already know that provinces uh, are not in agreement with this idea. So I think this is, this is one factor that would um, work in favor of overturning Ford. And then we have the last two, which are the more, most interesting ones. So the prior decision, is it contrary to sound principle? This is very mysterious. What are sound principles? What's sound principle? So I've checked, and what we, we, we get is, does the prior decision result in unfairness? Are foundational princ uh, principles, sorry, there's another mistake, of human and civil rights involved? So I'll leave that for the moment and get to the last one. Was the precedent decided per incurium? Is it now considered to be wrong? And so this is going to be uh, what I'm going to talk now about and return to the principles at the very end of the talk. So was the precedent decided per incurium? Is it considered to be wrong? In order to answer that very simple question, we have to do a very difficult demonstration. So don't be afraid of what comes now. <laughs> so what did the court do in Ford? So the court looked only at the text of Section 33, only the text. And it said, in that text, I read no substantive requirement only formal requirements, and the text as interpreted allows for standard derogation and omnibus bill legislation. Someone somewhere said, well, you know, there are objectives to Section 33. It's supposed to be doing this. It's supposed to protect parliamentary sovereignty. It's supposed to ensure pro a democratic process. The court said these are irrelevant and unhelpful. So the decision to completely not examine purposes is what it did. And then all the other aspects of interpretive analysis were just not examined, not raised, not discussed. And so the decision is only about the text of Section 33. So in my opinion, there are, there are three fundamental mistakes in that decision. The first one is that the interpretation is solely based on text. This is against principles of interpretation. 
The second point is the textual interpretation is, is wrong. The way the court read section 33, I believe, with all due respect, is wrong. And another mistake is when the court said, when you ask the legislature to establish a link between its law and the overridden provisions, this is a substantive requirement. So I think this is a third mistake. The fact that the court considers that asking the legislature to be clear about what it's doing, that that would be opening the way to substantive inquiry. I think this is also wrong. So if we're go going to reinterpret section 33, we have to do it the right way. And that is provided for by a superb article by Vanessa McDonnell on charter interpretation. What is purposive analysis? Where is it now? Where was it just uh, 40 years ago? And how did it travel? I like what you say, in such a long distance, uh, in such a short time. So I'm not going to get into the details. I, I want you to read her paper. And to please the people who believe that text is supreme, I'm going to start with text. But text is not the only thing. There's also the object, the purpose, or the interest that is protected. Then there's also the history or the intention. You know, why was this particular provision included in the, in the, in the charter? And then you have context, or what the court calls other components of the Constitution. I'm not going to look at all the components. I'm just going to look at, you know, principles. So, um, if we start with the text, I have a color code for you. So in red, you see the words per adepti ex may expressly declare. I think this is the, the, the crux of the problem, is that you know, we cannot take these words and, and say we have to read into them a whole you know, list of substantive criteria because it is so dry may expressly declare, per adepti. There are no, nothing is in there. But a lot of provisions are like that. You know, nothing is in there, and the court still could read in. But if you compare that to section 32, which says that, you know, the charter applies to matters within the authority of parliament, this allowed the court to interpret the words within the authority What's authority? What, what's it within your authority? You know, this is an open textured word. The same with section one. You know, what are the limitations to right that are, that are reasonable in a, in a democratic society? What's a democratic, what's a free and democratic society? Those, those are open textured words. And also in section 24, you know, when the court has to find an, a remedy that is appropriate and just. Appropriate and just are words that, you know, you could work around. But per adopté, who may expressly declare, I recognize that those are pretty dry. In blue, why I said earlier on that I think uh, it was wrong to allow for um, omnibus bills, we talk about the province being able, or the parliament being able to adopt une loi, où il est expressément déclaré que celle-ci, ou une de ses dispositions, and then in paragraph two, la loi ou la disposition. <clears throat> you can tell me an omnibus bill is une loi. But I think what, it's not what, the, what is meant by these words. We're, we're talking about one law that derogates to certain rights. And if we give these words their plain meaning, we're not, uh, we're not seeing a plain authorization to use omnibus bills. And then in green, you have the other side of the argument, the standard override. I think when you read the words in green, you cannot see a standard override being allowed in these, the way these words are written just uh, literally when you read them. A effet indépendamment d'une disposition donnée, sauf la disposition en cause. Obviously, you could derogate to more than one provision, but to do it standard, you know, two and se seven to 15 all the time, I don't think it respects the wording of section 33. So if we look now at the intention, the history, we can look at all the declarations by 
uh, those who participated in the debates, we have a lot of, uh, of uh, data on that. And we also can look at the prior drafts of the provision. It was not, it's not true that it was just like, you know, st stuck at the very end in the deal and, and, and people didn't have time to think about it. It had been discussed earlier on. And so uh, looking at these declarations, what I get from them is the following three points. I think the clause in itself, section 33, was not polarizing. It was seen as a way to curb an errant court when a decision would run against public interest. And also, it would allow the legislature to have the last word in what we call a grand question d'intérêt public. And the past was sort of a warranty for the future because we had derogation clauses before and they were not you know, always abused. And so we thought that you know, the tradition would continue. We all f often talk about Pierre et Le Trudeau as being formerly opposed to, and it's true that in his memoir, he writes that this derogation clause revolted him. Uh, but uh, André Burel, his speechwriter, actually uh, you know, wrote an article in Le Devoir where he returns to this, uh, this idea of, uh, of rejecting the derogation clause. And in fact, he said that he wasn't quite opposed to it as much as we think he was. And he even talked about the possibility of using it, certainly not bread and butter, certainly not all the time, but for exceptional circumstances that he thought would warrant it, he would not have an objection in using it. And in one of the speeches that uh, Burel wrote for him, that you can find in his book, he actually presents the derogation clause as being mandatory in order for the charter to meet the, uh, the, uh, the requirements of the patriation reference, where the court had said you could patriate the Constitution you know, unilaterally, but it's, it would be more legitimate if you would do it with the consent of you know, a certain number of provinces. And so in order to get, to get that consent, uh, the clause was being presented as being mandatory so that we get that consent so that our charter is legitimate, not only legal, but also legitimate. So I thought that was an interesting twist as well. So if we look at that, uh, and now at the, at the purposes, sorry, and the interest that is protected, let's start with what is not protected by section 33. I think the purpose was not to provide an instrument like the charter with a supremacy and then tone it down with a manner and form provision like we have in subnational constitution. This is a fundamental difference between the derogations that you have in like the Quebec Charter or in, in uh, the Ontario Human Rights Code. Those are needed in order at the same time to give priority over ordinary legislation to a law which is by definition ordinary. So you need these to give priority and then because the parliament cannot bind itself for the future on mat matters of sub substance, then you need to have a manner and form provision that allows the legislature to you know, go around it when needed. So the purpose is not, like, is not that because we had a supremacy clause in, uh, in, the, in the section 52 of the constitution. The purpose is not to provide for states of emergencies. We had the War Measures Act at the time, and this is very different from derogation clauses that you find in international treaties that are uh, targeting not the legislative function, but the executive power. So th they are also different from what you have in international, uh, in international treaties. And so what is the purpose? <laughs> I think there are two purposes. The first is to bridge legal and political constitutionalism, and so to allow the legislatures to, yes, have the last word, if you want, uh, when there's you know, an error that the legislature finds in a precedent, uh, but it's not the only scenario. You know, I think Section 33 should be un understood as trait d'union between the past of Canada, where you had 
legislative supremacy over rights. You didn't have that over division of powers or structure, but you had it over rights. And the new era started in 1982, where the courts had this role of invalidating legislation based on a violation of rights. That was new. So in order to keep you know, a foot in the past, we have Section 33, which is a reminder also that not all constitutions have bills of rights. You could have a democracy thriving without an entrenched bill of rights. I guess it's easier when you have it. But you could totally go without it and still be called a democracy. So I think this is the first purpose that is the most often associated with this condition that you know, Section 33 be used only to react to a court decision. Because this goes with it, right? So you know that either you have a different point of view on a question or you think the court was wrong, and then you derogate, you use your override power. I think this is common to any state that is not quite ready to go all the way legal constitutionalism, entrenched charter, no derogation clause. This is not typical to a federation or a unitary state. It, it is for any state which is in that situation. The other purpose for me is to allow for a form of, of pluralistic constitutionalism, which is especially important in a multinational federation. And here I'd like to draw your attention to two quotes by Simone Chambers. The first one is very simple. Everyone wants a Bill of Rights, but not everyone understands rights in the same way. And the second, the idea is not that a constitution should bring order to a fragmented world, but on the contrary, the constitution must reflect the multiple identities which make up the political order in order for each person to see themselves, to be recognized in the constitution. So in Quebec, we have Luc Tremblay who developed and who wrote a lot about this idea of pluralistic constitutionalism. And it is often opposed to liberal constitutionalism, which we must, we are more familiar. And so in the liberal constitutionalism, you are working with a single demos, single concept of right, and usually you have a certain national homogeneity, which you don't have in the pluralistic constitutionalism, which rests on the idea of several demoi and accommodates differing conceptions of fundamental rights but not necessarily as to the core of these rights, but certainly as to the periphery of these rights. And you have that in deeply diverse and heterogeneous societies. And in Canada, if you look at the, the, the system of constitutional right protection, you find a lot of elements that are associated with pluralistic constitutionalism. We have that through reasonable accommodation. We have that through section um, one. Now, if you go back to the, the reasons why we have Section 33, Alan Blakeney, his idea about Section 33, which is well documented, is this idea that we should keep the door open for moral rights which are not in the Constitution, but which are important for a certain jurisdiction, for example. And so you have these, these uh, uh, successful attempts, if, if you want, but you have unsuccessful attempts as well like the Charlottetown Canada Clause, which could be seen as a failed attempt to uh, force upon courts a certain degree of pluralistic constitutionalism. And we know how certain uh, persons reacted very strongly about this idea of, of a hierarchy of rights. So it depends how you see it. You see it as creating a hierarchy among citizens, or you see it as creating a way to interpret rights in a pluralistic way. So, here we have to talk about the relationship between federalism and rights. We cannot talk only about rights. We have to know that in a federation, we see one ad advantage of a federation for the protection of rights is to have the multiplicity of levels of protections. Is the citizen doesn't have only one level of protection, it has several levels of protections. And so traditionally, we associate federalism with an increased uh, level of protection. Subnational constitutions then, like Alan Blakeney um, you know, hinted, 
they have a major role to play, especially in a federation such as ours. And there, ha there is scholarship on the relationship between uh, subnational constitutions and national constitutions. These interactions are very important, but under theorized here in Canada. So we have four types of relationships. One is the guarantee given by a provincial charter is superior to the one given by the federal one. So think about Quebec codifying economic and social rights in the Quebec Charter. But these economic and social rights are not in the Canadian Charter. Second uh, relationship, the guarantees in both charters is equal. They mean the same thing. The third, the guarantees are different. Um, so, you know, Section 7 in Quebec doesn't include fundamental rights, but it's not completely different. Then you have its last scenario where the guarantee in the provincial charter is more limited than in the federal one. And this, according to some scholars, is just impossible. So I want you to um, look now at a quote by Stephen Tierney, who came to Montreal a few weeks ago and presented his last book, The Federal Contract. And we had a discussion about exactly that question of how you have in a federation different views of rights and how do you go around this paradox where you, you need an equality among the citizens but you also need provinces and units to have their own control over social policy and the rights that often go with them. So in his opinion, in the end, we should leave the matters um, to the political system and the pluralism and so the Constitution should allow for differences to be reflected in policy divergence and all within the parameters of maintaining a coherent state project. So the point is, when you have a federal constitution, you have to recognize that you will get different political positions and values across the federal polity. And the better view, in his opinion, is to keep the Constitution to the minimum of things that you need to sustain a coherent state project. And the rest of that, the other matters, that should be left to the political system and to pluralism. So pluralism is difficult, OK? I'm sorry for the extra long quote. Don't read it. <laughs> in Ward, the decision about the stand-up comedian who laughed at a young handicapped boy. We had this problem of pluralism, where the Quebec Charter was, um, you know, limiting, uh, was, was uh, uh, well, sorry, I think it's better that I read it. The, 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 um, the dissenting judges, Kazir and uh, another judge, uh, they noticed that the scope of protection of both instruments was different. Yet, it decided to apply the Quebec Charter because it provided an additional limitation on free speech. So the thing is, um, the, the majority of the court strongly disagreed with this, uh, privileging the Quebec Charter over the Canadian Charter on a question of rights. Why? Because they considered that uh, we should um, interpret the Quebec Charter as much as possible in symmetry with the Canadian Charter. And it's, it notes that um, the Canadian Charter guarantees freedom of expression, but not does not recognize a positive right to the safeguard of dignity, which the Quebec Charter did. So the dissenting judges were OK with applying the Quebec Charter, which recognized a right to dignity. But the majority said, no, we should go with the Canadian Charter, which does not recognize this right to dignity. So where am I getting with all this? I, discussing with my husband, who's a tax lawyer, he said, you know, Section 33 is perhaps like a switch over provision. It's something that you should get to allow you, as a jurisdiction, to apply your own system when something is really of, of importance for you. But if that is so, you cannot double derogate. Because if your purpose is to protect a part of your law that is so intrinsically important for you, 
as a nation, as a society, as a population, then the idea of a double derogation doesn't work. If that is the purpose, then you should not be able to derogate to your own system. But it comes with a condition. The condition is that courts must cooperate. Courts must stop doing what they did in Ward and trying to harmonize all the time provisions that are not necessarily symmetrical and that were not meant to be symmetrical. And if Quebec wants to protect the right to dignity, well, so be it. You cannot say, no, we have to displace the Quebec Charter here because it guarantees a right to dignity. So this is a, 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 um, you know, a proposition that I'm not totally sure about. But my instinct is that if your idea is you want to put forward your own system, so then it's a switch over provision. You use Section 33 because you consider that on this particular point, it's not the Canadian Charter of Rights that should apply. It's your charter. But then you should not double derogate. You should you know, have the confidence of submitting your legislation to your own system. But then the courts must cooperate and apply your own system and not all the time the Canadian system. So I think it's a question of the logic of federalism being important in, uh, important in the logic of, of fundamental rights. The logic of federalism for me is not a question of hierarchy. It's a question of coordination. So we have to learn to coordinate several bills of rights and allow uh, this singleness uh, to, uh, to, to triumph. So the last part of my talk is uh, how Article uh, Section 33 relates to implicit principles. So what is the role of, of, uh, of underlying principles? We saw them in Ville de Toronto, City of Toronto recently. So you could use them to interpret the charter, to feed doctrinal, uh, structural doctrines, but not to invalidate legislation. So we're not going to do that. We're not going to invalidate legislation. So first of all, I'm going to go very quickly because I think my time is almost up. Uh, so democracy. Is democracy fostered by Section 33? I think so, to a certain extent. It is fostered because it does allow the legislature to have the last word. Okay. But then how do you get to the last word? How do you express it? Do you have uh, an electoral system which allows minorities to be represented? Do you allow a derogation to be adopted under closure? If you do that, I don't think you respect democracy. Federalism, we just talked about it. It allows a provincial unit to push forward its own policy, its own values on a particular question. And I think it is clear that Section 33 can be totally reconciled with federalism. Constitutionalism is more tricky. It's trickier because when you interpret Section 33, you cannot get an absurd result. You cannot get the deconstitutionalization of the charter just by applying it the way uh, you know the Ford decision invites us to apply it, because a law doesn't cannot lead the interpretation of a law cannot lead to an absurd result. So if everyone starts using you know the derogation clause all the time, what you would get is a deconstitutionalization, which is not allowed by the constitution. We do have you know, two particular ways to deconstitutionalize. Those are section 44, section 45 in the amending formula. And those allow the federal uh, uh, legislature or the provinces to deconstitutionalize parts that are not important for the whole of the country, that are not part of the compromise. They can deconstitutionalize, amend themselves, small parts of the constitution, not those that relate to the core. And so when you interpret Section 33 with constitutionalism, you must overturn Ford because Ford would lead to a deconstitutionalization unilaterally of the charter on the long term. And then regarding the rule of law, I think here uh, we have to go back to Justice Jacques' decision, which is very uh, rich. And he, I think he's the one who best explained the link between uh, the rule of law and the derogation power. And basically, you cannot allow yourself to derogate if you don't explain the, to the population what you're doing and, what you're do and why you're doing it. Don't let the people figure out which right is being overridden by which provision of which law. 
You know, it's not, for, like Jacques said, there's no link between la loi sur la raffinerie du sucre and freedom of religion. There's no link, so you shouldn't allow this type of derogation. And finally, the wild card, protection of minorities, I think this principle, when the court examines it next, must evolve from where it was in, in the secession reference, uh, because back then it only protected uh, provincial minorities. And so the rights of, of Catholic students in, in Ontario, of, 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 of Protestant English-speaking students in Quebec, and so on. So, so as a summary, I think uh, the history, the text, the intent, the purpose, and the relationship to other components all point out to the fact that the Ford interpretation does not hold and thus must be overturned. And because I don't think I have more time, I will not go into my last part, which is what should be read into section 33. I will leave the suspense to, uh, uh, c'est ça, j'arrête? Uh, no, no, but, I mean, like, we're, I'm very tempted, I'm sure we are. <laughs> <laughs> Just give us a flavor. Okay, okay, <laughs> c'est juste une slide. Okay, alors, first of all, if I were a judge, but I'm not, what would I do? The text of section 33, I, I think, and the intention of the constituent, they run against the use of standard derogation clauses and omnibus bills. So right off the bat, these things, they should fall. Then, I think the legislature must establish a link between the law and the overridden provisions and see the Saskatchewan law for an example of that. I think this respects the information that the population needs according to the rule of law principle. So the purpose of protecting legislative sovereignty and curbing an errant court should require that a legislature wait for a decision, so no preemptive use. But if the purpose is not that, if the purpose is switching over a matter locally when identity-based considerations are involved, then they should not be allowed to have double derogations. Then you should refer to your own system of law, but on the condition that the court understands that and apply pluralistic constitutionalism and not try to merge everything into the Canadian Charter. And finally, I think the democratic principle signifies that there should be no derogation under closure and um, a derogation should require a reinforced majority. So I have a question for you. Are these formal or substantive requirements? And does it matter? Why should it matter uh, that these requirements be not you know, formal, be not uh, substantive? I think it's a false uh, d dilemma. And that's a question I have for, for everyone, actually. Should, why should the distinction be between form and substance? Normally, judicial review is tailored to the power at stake. And I have just two examples for you. Parliamentary privilege, the courts must look at the existence of a privilege. Once it finds the existence, it will not look into the exercise. So that's a criteria. Does it exist? You know, If it exists, it has to answer the criteria of necessity. So it's not form versus substance. It's a different type of analysis. When you look at the crown prerogative in foreign affairs, then you know if you have a question of high policy, you tailor your judicial review accordingly. So why do we have to work with this form versus substance distinction? I think uh, that's the, um, it's, a, it's a hypothesis of why we're working around form versus substance, because we are used to derogation clauses and quasi-constitutional instruments, which are manner and form provisions. By definition, it's a manner and form provision. It cannot bind the legislature for the future except on matters of form, and we see uh, we see these um, uh, ordinary statutes, which we call quasi-constitutional, uh, and that they embody derogation clauses, all of them, almost all of them, but all these clauses and the Declaration of Rights as well are manner and form provisions, but the purpose of Section 33 is not to be a manner and form provision, or maybe it is. So that's my question. Uh, and as a conclusion, and I thank Vanessa for the extra minutes, I think Section 33 fulfills a fundamental mission, but it must be interpreted uh, according to all these elements that we've just discussed. So thank you very much for your attention.
So thank you, Nura, for um, really a, a tour de force and, and for raising um, so many of the different uh, issues and, and aspects of Section 33. So what we're going to do now is have a discussion about uh, Section 33. And um, one of the things that uh, certainly I was thinking about when we were putting this panel together was um, the kind of variety of different perspectives that exist on Section 33 and hoping to get some of those different perspectives out on the table. Uh, and so what I thought we might do is to start off with, um, well, let's, you know, maybe we'll, we'll go right to you, Professor Peltier. Um, one of the themes, or the theme that has been soulevés par the uh, discourse de, de la professeur uh, Karazavan, is how the utilisation of the clause derogatoire in the province of Quebec is unique. Um, so can you tell us a bit and talk to us about your research on the distinctive considerations that apply when Section 33 is invoked in Quebec. Merci. Uh, merci de m'avoir invité. D'abord, uh, je suis honoré de participer à ce panel. Et je dois vous dire que ma perspective sur la disposition de dérogation uh, est influencée par la carrière politique que j'ai eue sous le gouvernement de Jean Charest pendant plusieurs années, et également dans l'opposition officielle à Québec. Et je dis que c'est influencé par cette carrière politique parce que, euh, pour moi, la disposition dérogatoire répond à un besoin d'équilibrer davantage la relation entre le pouvoir législatif, d'une part, et le pouvoir exécutif, et la relation entre ces pouvoirs-là et le pouvoir judiciaire. En d'autres termes, je euh, me plains d'une trop grande judicialisation du système politique canadien. Et je pense que la disposition dérogatoire permet à certains égards de rétablir cet équilibre dont je viens de parler entre, d'un côté, le pouvoir législatif et le pouvoir exécutif, et de l'autre côté, le pouvoir judiciaire. Cela dit, je suis tout à fait conscient que s'il est vrai que le législateur peut être appelé à faire des choix collectifs fondamentaux, et s'il est vrai que le législateur est formé d'élus du peuple, il en reste pas moins qu'il n'y a probablement pas un groupe social qui a un quotient intellectuel plus inférieur que le caucus d'un parti politique chauffé à bloc, bien partisan. En d'autres mots, je suis tout à fait conscient que même dans l'arène politique, et peut-être surtout dans l'arène politique, étant donné la fébrilité qui y règne et la partisanerie qui y règne par ailleurs, je suis tout à fait conscient que dans le domaine politique, ben, les choix collectifs, parfois, ne sont pas les bons. Et que les choix collectifs, ben, du moins, ne euh, poursuivent pas l'objectif d'atteindre ce qu'on appelle l'intérêt commun ou le, le bien commun. J'en suis tout à fait conscient. Mais donc, ma perspective sur la disposition dérogatoire est influencée par ma, ma carrière politique et ma perspective est influencée par ma carrière politique au Québec. Parce que je fais un lien entre l'expression de la spécificité québécoise et la disposition dérogatoire. Et je dis que nous n'en serions peut-être pas là si la Cour suprême n'utilisait pas un test aussi sévère dans l'application de l'article 1 de la Charte canadienne des droits et libertés. En d'autres mots, euh, la disposition dérogatoire est vue au Québec comme étant un outil d'expression de la spécificité québécoise à l'intérieur du Canada. Et ça ne doit pas être perdu de vue, cela. Euh, en d'autres mots, euh, la disposition dérogatoire est plutôt bien vue au Québec en raison du fait que 
Un bon nombre de Québécois ne demandent pas mieux que d'être Canadiens, mais ils veulent être Canadiens à leur façon. En d'autres mots, l'approche uniformisante de la Charte canadienne des droits et libertés est quelque chose qui déplaît à un certain nombre de Québécois. C'est quelque chose qui freine ou qui gêne l'expression de la spécificité québécoise. Et la disposition dérogatoire devient un outil pour favoriser l'expression de cette spécificité, l'expression finalement de ce caractère unique, de ce caractère spécifique que le Québec à l'intérieur du Canada. Et en même temps, euh, il faut comprendre que euh, j'ai été gêné par l'utilisation de la clause dérogatoire en Ontario. En d'autres mots, moi aussi, je me pose des questions. Parce que j'estime beaucoup, évidemment, j'apprécie beaucoup l'importance des droits et libertés au Canada. Mais en même temps, je suis conscient que parfois, il y a des choix collectifs qui s'imposent dans la société. Et il y a aussi des occasions où ces choix collectifs-là sont peut-être mieux faits par les élus du peuple que par des juges nommés par le gouvernement. Et en d'autres mots, la disposition dérogatoire n'est pas complètement incompatible avec la démocratie, loin de là, mais cette démocratie que nous appelons de nos voeux, c'est ce qu'on appelle une démocratie libérale. C'est-à-dire une démocratie qui tient compte ég également des intérêts des minorités, des groupes minoritaires. Ce qui complique les choses. Comment concilier le respect des droits des groupes minoritaires avec la poursuite d'intérêts collectifs et, dans le cas du Québec, finalement, la recherche de l'affirmation d'une identité particulière au sein du Canada. C'est ça toute la question que pose pour moi la disposition dérogatoire. Et c'est peut-être pour cela que, dans le fond, pour les gouvernements qui utilisent la clause dérogatoire au Québec, ou la disposition de dérogation, ou la... la, la voilà... Pour les gouvernements qui utilisent cette disposition-là au Québec, il n'y a pas beaucoup de prix politiques à payer. Il y en a eu un en Ontario. 24-48 heures après, le gouvernement de l'Ontario renonça à sa loi en disant même qu'elle n'avait jamais existé. Figurez-vous. Mais au Québec, il n'y a pas de prix politique. La preuve, c'est que la CAQ a été élue avec 90 députés sur 125. Au contraire, les Québécois favorisent l'usage de la disposition dérogatoire parce qu'à quelque part, à quelque part, les Québécois se sentent étouffés à l'intérieur du Canada. Et je pense que, malheureusement, il y a une certaine insensibilité de la part d'un certain nombre de Canadiens par rapport à la spécificité québécoise. Quand ce n'est pas une hostilité, alors que moi, quand j'étais dans l'arène politique, et je termine avec ça, quand j'étais dans l'arène politique, je soutenais, parce qu'oubliez pas que dans l'arène politique, nous, les libéraux au Québec, nous étions à, à l'avant-plan des forces fédéralistes. Et nous nous opposions aux forces souverainistes au Québec. Il ne faut pas l'oublier. Mais je disais, je répétais, en espérant que d'autres Canadiens dans d'autres provinces l'entendent, que la spécificité du Québec, loin d'être un obstacle pour l'unité canadienne, est une grande valeur canadienne qui devrait être davantage promue comme telle dans notre pays. I would vote for you. <laughs> That was very passionate. And I, you know, I, I want to say I'm going to um, insert myself strategically uh, once or twice here because I, I do have many thoughts on Section 33. Um, but one of them is the extent to which I appreciate um, the perspective that, uh, that Benoit and Noura uh, and others bring to this, uh, this discussion because, you know, my sense is um, in a lot of the kind of first generation English language scholarship 
on the notwithstanding clause. Um, a lot of these arguments were not part of the conversation and the English scholarship. And I think um, the nuance with which you're, you're presenting the, the, these points, and you know, again, in the work that Nora and Jean-Francois had done, um, I know one of the points that, that they make is that actually the notwithstanding clause has played a role in undermining the rights culture in Quebec, that a vibrant rights, uh, uh, vibrant rights culture has been to some extent undermined by what happened in 1982 and the exclusion of Quebec from the final compact and, and you know, leading to everything that happened after that with the notwithstanding clause. And so um, I think the second generation scholarship has to contend meaningfully. Um, and you know, hopefully we're, we're starting to talk to each other more than we did um, before, but I think that um, the second generation scholarship has to contend with these federalism arguments. And, you know, l'autre chose, moi je dirais que ça ne veut pas dire que, que chaque loi où le Québec utilise la clause non obstante est une bonne instance de l'utilisation de, de cette clause-là. The fact that, you know, we might think that there are circumstances under which the clause, you know, ought not to have been used, I don't think necessarily undermines the principled arguments for the role that this um, clause plays in, in, um, in maintaining the health and vitality of our federation. Okay, I'm going to, uh, we had agreed on a bit of a question order and I'm going to derogate from it. Um, sorry, I, I, I'm not funny at the best of times, but... <laughs> Um, and I'm actually going to go to Professor Dodek because I, I think some of the things that I'd like to talk to you about, Professor Dodek, um, flows from uh, points raised by Professor Peltier about the kind of balance between uh, law and politics that, this, that Section 33 represents, but also the kind of constitutional division of labor that it contemplates and the possibility that Section 33 is invoked in circumstances where for important reasons, we want the decision to be one made by political actors. And so um, you recently published an op-ed uh, in the Globe and Mail, Professor Dodek, where you called on the courts to, um, to adopt a meaningful supervisory role in, uh, in supervising uses of Section 33. And so I'm hoping that, that maybe you can say more about that. Sure. Um, so what, what I said in the op-ed was that the courts should revisit Section 33 and that the federal government should take a leadership role in directing uh, a reference to that. So I just sort of elaborate on, uh, on both those aspects. So uh, I really enjoyed uh, Professor uh, um, Karabazian's presentation. Uh, and, you know, the, to me the question, should Section 33 be reconsidered is a strange question, right? We, we don't ask that about any other section of the charter. It's hard to imagine any other section where there's been one decision where we're one and done. Uh, I have, I have the, the great privilege of teaching first year public and constitutional law in this semester going back and revisiting all of these early charter decisions. And Andrews, these foundational chart in section 15, or Irwin Toy in section two, sec Morgenthaler in section seven, and they're the beginning. They're not the end of a conversation. They're the beginning of a conversation. Yet it seems for some reason that Ford, a case decided more than now 35 years ago, has become both the beginning and the end of a conversation around section 33. Um, and a couple of observations about that, that in a sense, in Ford, the, the Supreme Court treated Section 33 not so much as part of the Charter, but outside the Charter. Uh, Professor Peltier made this observation that I just wrote down about, in a sense, the reaction in Quebec being uh, to the notwithstanding clause, a reaction to the court's use of Section 1. Well, in Ford, there's no consideration of Section 1. And the no connection to purposive interpretation. And Professor Karabazian 
gave these two quotes from recent Supreme Court decisions that engage with the purpose. I went back and looked at the Ford decision. There is a reference to Hunter and Southam, the foundational case about purposive interpretation, but it's not about Section 33. It's about freedom of expression. Um, and when you look at, at Section 33, when you look at Ford, it is a rather superficial decision. And in that, I, 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 don't, I don't mean that in a negative way. Another way to explain that might be it's a foundational decision. It's a first foray. It's a building block for, for further consideration. And when you look at other areas of constitutional interpretation, there is sometimes there is a there is a tacking back and forth. There is a tango. There is a there is a vibrancy to constitutional interpretation. There is a development. There is a, a retrenchment. There is a back and forth. There is a discussion. Um, in in the 1990s, Professor Hogg, the late Professor Hogg, called it a dialogue. And he actually did connect Section 33 to Section 1, something that the Supreme Court did not do in Ford. In terms of the idea that, that somehow we, were, we would be restricted to the text of Section 33, or the Supreme Court should be in, restricted to the, the, the text of Section 33 and couldn't add on other requirements to that, that again seems to me somewhat strange or, or alien to the um, the constitutional culture of constitutional interpretation in this country. The Supreme Court has been very willing to add on extra textual requirements or justifications in Section 35 and aspects outside of the Charter. And that sort of leads me to, again, the, the court in Ford seeing Section 33 not so much as part of the charter, but in a sense, part of the old constitutionalism. And Professor Kiravazin talked about the the idea of Section 33 being, or Ford being a bridge between old and new. And I see the Ford decision very much sort of stuck in a, a pre-charter interpretation about um, rights that governments hold um, without sort of building on that. The last thing I would notice in terms of should it be reconsidered, I teach a seminar in the Supreme Court of Canada, and we look at the Supreme Court as an institution. The era of Ford, Irwin Toy was a, a strange era for the Supreme Court. Um, Ford, clearly one of the foundational, most important decisions of the Supreme Court of its era, and still to this day. For some reason, which I haven't investigated, the court only sat seven. And two judges did not participate in the, in the decision of the case because by that time they had left the court. So from an institutional perspective, I think something as important as Section 35, uh, Section 33 deserves uh, a full rehearing by the court. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor Dodek. So, um, now I'd like to uh, turn to uh, Professor Lagasse and uh, ask you a question that, that builds on some of uh, Professor Karazavan's comments about uh, unwritten principles. Uh, and so, uh, Phil, you and I have been doing some work over the last year or so on uh, thinking through the nature of unwritten constitutional principles um, and, and our discussions of late have turned to section uh, 33. And so I, I guess I'm curious what your thoughts are about the role that uh, unwritten principles might play in, in structuring uses of the notwithstanding clause. Um, and maybe as a, a kind of, f or relatedly, um, you know, what, what unwritten principles uh, might tell us about uh, you know, who's in charge of Section 33, the extent to which Section 33 is um, is a section over which, you know, courts should uh, should be in charge or, or whether uh, or whether Section 33 really is about punting important constitutional issues into the political sphere. Uh, thanks, Vanessa. 
I think I'll, I'll, I'll is, this, is this working? Yeah. Uh, I'll start with the the first principle I think that, that was discussed, which is the democratic one. Uh, et on, on a tendance à parler de démocratie libérale. Et de mon point de vue, en réalité, il y a le principe démocratique, il y a également le, principe, le, le principe de la, du libéralisme. Ce n'est pas nécessairement euh, les mêmes choses. And I think Section 33 aims to, when you're looking at it as, as a, from a, the, the perspective of constitutional principles, I think it engages three of them. The, the first being the democratic principle itself. Donc, et ça revient à ce que le professeur Paletti a dit, la, la capacité de la législature et, et même que, quand, quand l'article 33 a été, a été formulé, la politique était partisane, les législateurs étaient mauvais autant. C'était pas, on, on vit pas en ce moment dans une époque où soudainement les politiciens sont pires que, qui, qui, on, les politiciens, la partisanerie, ça a toujours été la réalité de la politique. Donc, on savait quand on a écrit euh, 33 que c'était la réalité. La démocratie, elle a toujours été sale, elle a toujours été complexe, elle a toujours été euh, une réalité qui, 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 qui ne vit pas dans nos idéaux. Ça, on le sait. Donc, the democratic principle has always been messy. And it's always recognized that in our system, that what, what is that fundamentally about? It's fundamentally, it, it, when you look at it from the historical point of view, the ability of the legislature to, to make final decisions. And in making that final decision, I do think that, that the link that is made between the political and the legal constitution is important. And I think there is something to be said, and we're even seeing it a little bit in other decisions of the court lately, uh, what I would call the revenge of the 1867 constitution, where you know we had 40 years where the, the 82 constitution was almost considered the constitution in 1860-something was a bit of a holdover. But in reality, we, we do need to see the, the two of them together and the idea that the legislature uh, and the, de the democratic process as simply the expression of the legislature. And this is where maybe I disagree a little bit on whether or not you know closure or whatever. I don't know if it's for the courts to kind of get into that, right? Because in the same way that they wouldn't with parliamentary privilege, you, you don't want to start saying, well, for the democratic principle to be present, it, parliament has to express itself in a according to certain rules or in certain ways. It's just, that's it's not really for the court to be able to get into. Um, so a, as messy as it is, in a way, if you're going to have the democratic principle, section 33 was meant to be an homage to that and meant to preserve that, that older constitutional tradition. Um, and I say this in, in an interesting way, um, having doing comparative project now on Australia, New Zealand and the UK, where they don't have, in Australia, they don't have the charter, and yet they survive, right? It's, there is a tradition out there, it does exist, where you are able to rely on the political process and on the, on, on the expectations that we place upon politicians to actually uh, respect these rights. Um, and as my work with Vanessa kind of suggests, the more we step away from asking politicians to do that, the less willing they are. And I think this is what we saw with, with Ford, is suddenly, and I, I don't mean the case here, I mean the, the Ontario uh, situation, where suddenly a politician was faced with the reality of their political decision. And the more that that becomes the calculus, and the less it becomes about um, a standoff between institutions, I think the, the better off that we are. Uh, the, sur l'autre principe, je crois que on, 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 on discute parfois du libéralisme et du pluralisme. Il faut également reconnaître qu'il y a une pluralité de libéralisme. Donc, ce qui est intéressant pour moi en tant qu'individu qu qui, qui, qui lit <rire> non seulement les, les médias euh, du Canada anglais, mais également les médias du, du, du Canada français ou québécois, c'est qu'il y, y a un libéralisme québécois qui se retrouve également en France et dans d'autres pays européens, il serait, on, on trouverait ça bizarre de dire que la laciété, par exemple, ce n'est pas libéral. Oui, c'est libéral. C'est notre forme de libéralisme au Québec. Ça va à l'encontre peut-être du libéralisme dans la tradition anglo-saxonne. Bon, D'accord, forcément. Mais on ne peut pas dire non plus qu'il si, y a une, une sorte de libéralisme et le libéralisme 
veut toujours la primauté de, de l'individu. Il y a d'autres sortes de libéralisme qui, qui, qui valorisent la primauté de d'autres valeurs libérales. Et là, également, j'ai un peu de difficulté quand on dit le principe libéral ou le, le principe du libéralisme dans la Constitution canadienne, il faut reconnaître qu'il y a également une pluralité de, de ce principe et que différentes personnes auront différentes interprétations de ce principe et de son application. Et, and finally, just, uh, and I'm talking quite a bit here, um, on the last one I would point to is the separation of powers as a constitutional principle. I don't think we, we discuss it enough in this context. But what does the separation of powers as a principle tell us about Section 33? And here again, I think it is hearkening back to some extent to that older constitutional tradition where at the end of the day, um, as much as we recognize, and here this touches a little bit on what Professor Pensi was saying, I don't think we can see what's been happening with Section 33 without recognizing that we have been living under almost 50 years of what many politicians perceive as judicial supremacy. You have to see it within that political context. It, it is this belief that at the end of the day, as much as we talk about being in a, in a democracy, we're in many ways entering into a, jud a judicial technocracy. And Section 33, to some extent, is seen as a, a, the, a tool that you have in your toolkit to push back on that. It's not, it hasn't gotten to constitutional hardball yet, but it's certainly a constitutional rebalancing through what has been perceived, and for many people, I think, that the separation of powers is out of whack and that you have to bring some equilibrium to it, and if that's one tool that's available to you, then you might want to use it. Now, that doesn't necessarily justify it in each case, but it, uh, it that principle may apply as well. Merci. Thank you, Phil. Okay, so um, before I turn to Professor Mathen, I just want to give the panel a heads up <laughs> that once we hear from Professor Mathen, I'm going to just, we are going to wrap up, but I do want to ask everyone by way of conclusion for you know either one prediction or one question about what comes next, whether with Ford or Section 33 in the in the political arena or with the Bill 21 litigation, et cetera. So uh, one predic prediction or, or one question, and I will lead off uh, with that to give everyone a bit more time. Okay, so Professor Mathen, I want to take the federalism discussion in a slightly different uh, direction now. So you've been writing lately about the relationship between Section 33 and federalism. Uh, and in that context, you have urged jurisdictions to consider what you call unilateral disarmament. Can you speak to us about that? Yes, thank you very much. So I, I am writing now about what I think is a profound implication of Section 33, which obviously has very deep implications for individual rights, but I see it as having equally profound implications for Canadian federalism. And we've seen that in resurrection of disallowance as a thing, uh, at least by, by certain serious-minded people. It's intriguing to note that some of the arguments made about disallowance today, which I think are quite valid, would have been made 10 years ago about Section 33 itself. So I think we need to maintain some humility in when we declare you know, provisions of the Constitution um, spent or have fallen into desuetude or, or whatever. But disallowance obviously would be a, uh, I don't think it's likely, but it does raise very, very important implications for federalism. I think another uh, branch of this is around the prospect of judicial review of Section 33, particularly by the Supreme Court, which, although it hasn't been as much in evidence um, for many years, there is a historic suspicion of the Supreme Court of Canada as being a tool of centrist uh, political power that is not responsive to regional concerns. And there is a concern, I think there is at least a risk, of the court being drawn into that much older sort of posture uh, that we saw characterizing even the debates around the Supreme Court itself um, in 1875. But my final, uh, the, the, the final um, part of this particular paper that I've just finished is 
about the legislative branches of the country and how they can, how they might want to think about their own relationship to Section 33. So the general amending formula we know is, is not realistic. I'm not particularly happy about the defeatism we have to large scale constitutional reform, but I, I accept that. What else might there be? And here I think it is interesting to consider that among a very, very few number of general constitutional provisions, Section 33 is a provision that is entirely oriented towards the various orders of government um, in an exclusive way. So that while universal changes to Section 33, of course, would require at least the general amending formula, it doesn't seem to me evident that discrete decisions by a jurisdiction to make changes to its relationship to Section 33, or even perhaps to take it off the table, would not fall under another part of the, another one of the amending formulae in, in Part 5. Of course, yes, they could, this could also take the form of ordinary law, but I think that there is an opening to see that any single jurisdiction in Canada could contemplate changing in a formal way, its relationship to Section 33. And what that gives is the space within that polity for the debate to happen in a way that is not dependent on securing the acquiescence of seven of 10 provinces and the Parliament of Canada around the broader decision. But this is something that is important to us, and we want to have the political debate. What is the, what is the, what is the landscape around Section 33 going forward? final point I want to make is Parliament. So the federal Parliament, of course, has never used Section 33. And I think that once it does, if it were to do so, we will be in a paradigm shift. And there may be a point of no return to that because of the nature of the subject matter jurisdiction in which parliament would be using it. And here I'm speaking primarily of criminal law, which to think, to go back to the point of double derogation, there is no human rights consideration for criminal law. So there is no other forum to protect that but the charter's legal rights. And I think that is something with which we should be very concerned. But because parliament has never used it, it creates an additional space for Parliament to think about and to frame actual political conversations and even make it an electoral issue. Does Parliament wish to take, in its own right, a different relationship to Section 33? I think it could also, if it were to do so, confirm, clarify what is the role of the upper house with respect to invocations of Section 33, which is, a, which is a factor that doesn't arise in any of the other jurisdictions, but I think raises really important issues. And so I think here, it's, it's, it's a way to have a discussion um, in the various orders of government mm -hmm. on something that is so essential, and it really dovetails nicely with the deeper federalism concerns that relate to the Constitution as a whole. Great. Um, well, as someone who also teaches first year constitutional law um, and who uh, did uh, actually go to law school at a time when it seemed that the 1982 constitution was all there was, um, I have to say that it is like very compelling and exciting to hear um, these sort of multifaceted discussions about Section 33 that really draw on constitutional fundamentals, on the nature of the federal compact, on the nature of the separation of powers, on bicameralism, uh, on, on these aspects of the Constitution that I think we are realizing, uh, you know, many, you know, never forgot, I guess, but we are again reminded um, the important role they play in our, in our public law and in our constitutional law. Okay, so I said we would do a quick uh, round table for one question or one prediction. Uh, and, and mine actually relates to, is a question, um, and it relates to the paragraph uh, that Noura put up from City of Toronto, paragraph 60. And I don't know if the part that I'm, I have a question about was in that, that quote, Noura, uh, because my vision is, is awful and I couldn't uh, see it from here. Um, 
but you'll recall that uh, in City of Toronto, the comments about Section 33 are in obiter, um, but they are also from the majority opinion. And uh, in paragraph, I think it's 60, of uh, City of Toronto, the majority decision, the majority frames Section 33 as being a mechanism of coordinate constitutional interpretation. And so quite unlike the way that the um, Section 33 is described in Ford, in City of Toronto, the majority suggests that uh, the notwithstanding clause permits Parliament to insist upon its interpretation of constitutional rights in a given situation. And that's actually quite a different interpretation of Section 33 than one which um, allows democratic actors to derogate from rights. Um, you're talking about a, a disagreement not about whether rights should be respected, but about competing interpretations of rights. And so to me, it's very interesting that the, the majority, without really canvassing um, uh, the, the possible interpretations of Section 33, the court just sort of comes out and talks about Section 33 as, as being about a, a disagreement, uh, involving disagreements about the meaning of rights. And so one question for me, as these cases proceed through the courts and as there is this robust public debate about the meaning of, of Section 33, is what does this mean? And is coordinate constitutional interpretation a plausible theory of Section 33? Um, and and if so, how far does how far does that take us? And do we like the vision of Section 33 that it produces? Okay, can I go back to you, Professor Mathen? Sure. So a question I have, which seems to be largely ignored by the advocates of both sides of the reconsideration of the jurisprudential questions around Section 33, is its relationship to Section 28. So I feel like I would, could not live with myself if I did not raise the very textual, uh, um, interesting questions about the relationship between those two sections in the Charter and the very dismissive attitude towards it that has predominated to date. But I, I do, I hope that uh, there will be an opportunity to consider what is the status of a use of Section 33 that uh, de derogates from the rights of male and female persons. Because I don't think that we can just wave that away. It was also a very important part of the constitutional negotiations and it has been utterly ignored and now we're in the the world where that is at least a legitimate question to consider and to consider in a serious way. Professor Pelletier. Oui, merci. Uh, D'abord concernant uh, la question qui vient d'être posée, la relation entre l'article 28 et l'article 33, je ne sais pas. Je ne le sais pas. Pour être franc, euh, je ne sais pas quelle interprétation il faut donner à euh, l'article 28 lui-même, mais c'est une excellente question, effectivement, qui se pose dans le débat actuel. Deuxième remarque, avant de faire une prédiction. Deuxième remarque, c'est qu'on voit également un courant, un courant jurisprudentiel où la Cour suprême dit c'était le cas par rapport à l'article 23 de la Charte canadienne des droits et libertés. La Cour suprême dit « L'article 23 n'est pas couvert par la disposition de dérogation, donc c'est une disposition très importante. » En d'autres mots, c'est comme si le constituant, en ne soumettant pas l'article 23 à la disposition de dérogation, avait placé l'article 23 au-dessus des autres droits et libertés qui, eux, sont soumis à la disposition de dérogation. Alors que ça devrait être le contraire. La Cour suprême devrait se dire si la disposition peut être finalement l'objet de la disposition d'une loi quelconque, 
cette disposition-là peut être l'objet de la dérogation, c'est donc que le législateur va avoir le dernier mot et c'est donc que je peux m'autoriser une interprétation plus large des droits et libertés. Mmh. En d'autres mots, euh, je vois une tendance mmh. se dessiner euh, et je pense que la Cour suprême a tort d'adopter cette tendance, mais je, je soumets tout simplement cette réflexion-là euh, à, à, à votre propre réflexion, parce qu'on est ici, dans le fond, pour soulever des questions, mais également pour faire une prédiction. Euh, ma prédiction, c'est que l'article 33 ne sera pas aboli, parce que tout le monde sait nous avons une procédure, un procédure, une procédure de modification constitutionnelle extrêmement complexe. Mais la Cour suprême peut être tentée, je dis bien, peut être tentée, de baliser l'usage préventif de la disposition de dérogation, parce que, ne serait-ce que pour la raison suivante, quand nous disons que la disposition de dérogation permet au législateur d'avoir le dernier mot, se soulève à ce moment-là la question de savoir qui doit avoir le premier mot. Mmh. Et il est tout à fait possible que la Cour suprême soit tentée de dire que les tribunaux doivent l'avoir. Enfin, ce n'est pas... Euh, ma prédiction, c'est que la disposition d'érogation ne sera pas abolie. Pour le reste, c'est tout simplement une réflexion que je livre à votre esprit. Well, that, that was a great prediction, so I'm not going to make a prediction. Um, <laughs> what comes next, I would say, has already happened, which is um, the notwithstanding clause going international. And so for those that aren't aware, there is a political, if not a constitutional crisis in Israel right now, centering around judicial reforms, five judicial reforms, and a key aspect of it is creating an override, which they call the Canadian override. <laughs> And I'll just leave it at that. Great. Uh, Professor Lagasse. Uh, just very quickly, if I'm, I, I think uh, my colleagues are correct that Pro Ford will probably be revised. And the reason I, I say this is because the, the issues that are before us now, and I, again, I say this as somebody who's more concerned with the political environment in which these decisions are made, is because they do involve minority rights. Uh, and as a result of that, it, that, that calls into the question the, the, the legitimacy of the democratic principle versus the liberal principle much more thoroughly. That said, uh, I would just add a note of caution going back to the quotes that were provided around the purpose of Section 33 as being within the public interest, protecting the public interest, having to be very careful about not preventing Uh, the protection of the public interest or creating limitations around Section 33 that prevent legislators or legislatures, I should say, from putting forward what they see as the public interest. We have to be very careful about that simply because the cases that we have before us today seem fairly clear cut around the rights of minorities. But in the future, the cases will not be as clear cut. And again, I, you know, we don't need to look very far to see where there are always dangers when you revise stardasis, uh, as we have seen in recent years. So be careful. So I would like to thank all of my colleagues, most especially Professor Karazavan for delivering the Feeney lecture, but all of the panelists for their, uh, their reflections this evening. I'll ask you to join me in giving them a round of applause. And I would like to invite you to join us now for a reception, which will be taking place in the auditorium just adjacent to this room. Thank you very much. <laughs>